Okay guys, I am on my way to Brendan and Kirsty's. Jerry, Brendan's mom, has some garden questions for me and I am going to do my very best to answer them. So, let's get to it. <laughs> to see you absolutely yeah so this is this is what I'm doing I love it so I have a ton of questions oh man <laughs> you you feel free to ask away okay um start with right here I started to cut back my raspberries I'm don't really understand the whole floricane and permacane thing is if I'm even saying that right okay so the way I do your raspberries produce usually all in one big burst or do they kind of produce all summer long? All summer long. Okay, so ever bearing raspberries, some of them have like, some of them just, it's like a one and done kind of thing. Okay. Some come up and put out fruit on the first year's growth or on like this year's growth, they'll shoot stuff up. Right. Some f usually focus their energy into last year's canes. Okay. Right? So the way I always treat mine is each year I try and like, so say this is a main plant. Like this right. feels like one main dude. Right. So these two that shoot up this year, yeah. I know. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> these two here that would pop up this year yeah. and get tall, I would leave those and that, that next year, I would just let them get like, tall and do their thing oh my god so many kisses is this last year's growth i guess I th and yes this is the year before um or is this see, last that's, year as well uh, i don't know so from what i understand these are new these are old and i only know that by the color i'm thinking those ones are last year's this one was this year's but i cut them back and i felt like i cut them too short by the time i hit the second one, it was like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm cutting them too short. I don't prune my raspberries back like this at all. Okay. I don't prune them down. Okay. These ones I thought, oh, so I went taller. You know what? You'll probably get good raspberries and everything still, right? It's yeah. like, just like, here's the thing. There's, it's not one size fits all. It's not like, this is the way that every single gardener should do it and there's right. no other way. There's a hundred friggin ways. Right. This is cool. You're probably still going to get a bunch of raspberries popping out of it. Yeah. And when you cut canes back like this, yeah. it promotes more growth from underneath, oh. which means that next year, because you've given these a really hard cutback, yeah. next year you could have yeah. double the amount of raspberries, okay. right? So Perfect. it's not the end of the world. Even if right. you did cut them too short, it's right. still cool. Right. Hey. Do you have pruners on you? I do. Okay, let's do this. Grab the pruners and then we'll just rock it out. The way I like to do this is I usually focus three main canes. Okay. So like, it looks here, like what you do is you cut them back short and then you get a bunch of bushier stuff that kind of comes up top. Let's see, I mean, here's the thing. You can see that last year, you cut this. Yes. So like I would definitely cut out any one. of last year's growth. Okay. And you know, here's the wild thing about this is like, I'm coming here to answer questions for you. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is that I have never once in my life cut my raspberries down like this. Yeah. But if you just got an extra four, four canes, shooting off of one like maybe that's a cool thing like this right. is making me want to try it i'm like sh should i dip my raspberry and when should i, I should yeah, I when i this? see when i see in your place i'm like all her raspberries are tall and they're full of and i'm like oh, i just butchered mine <laughs> it's it's totally okay though right yeah. so usually yeah. what i do is i try and focus on three main canes. Okay. So, like that skinny let's little see, one this guy be. goes. Okay. Cause that one looks like it's not doing as well as the others. 
is this considered one plant because it's or we don't know so it's, it's a little hard to tell yeah i was gonna say this look lo looks like its own to me okay and it looks like you have like this was previously one but this right. looked like one to me and okay. this looks like one to me okay so i would leave this main cane for yep. this yep. i would leave these main canes for that right. and these main canes okay. for that okay. and i would leave it like that now okay. i tie my raspberries back though that's the thing too right, right? so there is like maybe with you cutting them you get them lower and then you don't have to tie them back they're not yeah. as wild yes so it's like yes. if you do these ones tall you might right. want to bang in a couple posts and string for them up sure. for you know sure. for sure but that's typically how i do it is okay. i try and focus on and you can kind of tell like when you wiggle it yep. around oh see see how when i wiggle this one yep. this one doesn't move as much yep. that okay. feels like it's whole own plant to me right yeah so like, and when I wiggle this, you can see sort of that there's like a difference in this one here too. Right. Like how this one wiggles, yes. this looks attached to, like it was attached to it before. Right. But this looks like it's separate. That's okay. separate. That's separate. Okay. So. Perfect. I would leave all of that. Okay. I'm going to leave them tall because yeah. I want to try them tall this time. Yeah. So here, if something looks like this and it looks like it's kind of crunched back yeah. there, yeah. I would go ahead and just kind of snip that tip a little bit but right. that would be about all that i would do with it okay how long have these raspberries been in here well uh, we had to move them when the trees all came down oh so just a couple so, years ago then yeah like 2020 so this is their fourth year in okay the yeah there's they're totally still good in the box okay then. okay my raspberries i mean this is only their second season of growing since they've been aggressively transplanted well right. they've actually been transplanted this year again so right. who right. knows what they're going to do. <laughs> but when we were in Wanick and yeah. we had had them established in our zone for quite some time, our raspberries were taller than I could reach with oh. my fingers. And they fruited all, like basically from summer all into fall. We yes. could pick raspberries the entire time and they fruited all the way up to the top. Wow. But okay. what we do is we had um we had boxes there and then we had uh we had stakes banged in all the way around and then just drilled holes in them so we stringed all along the outside to just kind of keep them in and up because they will yeah. especially when the right? fruit comes yes. Yes. yes 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 so they will kind of get weighted down and bend over so yes. we definitely tie ours up and these guys here love my raspberries i always you know when i'm here in the morning and i'm picking fruit to have myself i'll be like oh here you go oh here you go and then i started noticing that they were coming along and they were like num 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 oh see so you little... need the height then you need you need the taller raspberries yes. so there's the dog zone yes very cool awesome well i'm definitely gonna leave these I'll do what you said. Tips yes. And cut back the old growth yep. for sure, right? Okay, yep. So cutting back last year's. Yep. And then the wiggle test, which I mean, yeah. Not I that it. that's a very professional. Like I don't know if it says any books to just <laughs> you know idea, to get the wiggles that. out. But if you yeah. if you give these a little wiggle, you yeah. can usually see yeah. this guy moves separately than yeah. this guy, yeah. right? So then you know that that guy's his own plant. Because I, I had read that you don't want any more than like three to four canes per plant. So I was like just looking yeah. at them, but I never did the wiggle test. Yeah. So the rule of three is what I do through most things at my okay. place. Like with tomatoes, I'm rule of three. Raspberries, rule of three. Like most things, that's, that's how I go. So, and what do you do with pampas grass? Like, I don't know if I'm cutting oh. it too late to, like, it's... Girl, I don't know anything about grass. Ugh. My mom grew pampas grass for years, and and it was, like, it it's an anomaly. Like, I, I don't know. It, like, it's not even a pretty pampas grass. Like, it gets these little, tiny, little... It's not the plumes that are beautiful. It just kind of... But it's pokey, and it's sharp. And it's, you know, so all I do is I just buck it off and then I try to use that to put along the fence line so I don't have to mow close. Mm, <laughs> I like that. all I do. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, I know nothing about pampas grass. I wish I could help you there, okay. but.
When I moved here, I was a city girl, you know, two little babies, you know, grew up in the city, came here, married into the farm, you know, Mark's parents bought this in 1970. Oh so 2020, it was 50 years. And then I'd been here now for 32 of those years. So I just feel so thankful, not only to have been able to raise my boys here and give them this life, because I had apartments and Safeway shopping carts for entertainment. These guys had the forest. So I'm super thankful for that. So if I can give back to this land, and even if it's just making dirt for the rest of my life, I'm cool with that. This here, yeah. I just thought I'd mention as I see this. Oh yeah. Do you see how these crisscross here? Yes. And then you can actually see that this has split. This here has gotten damaged and it's still surviving. It's, its bark is, is healing over, but there's actually a point where you can see it's been rubbing there and rubbing here. When you pull this back, you can see this bit here where it's been rubbing. Yes. So ideally the pieces that crisscross. This one. Yeah, the crisscross applesauce I'd get rid of, okay. but black currants uh, propagate really well. Do they? Yeah, so oh. if you cut this back, so say you cut this branch off, yep. when you cut this branch off, be ready with like, you know, you could fill up half a dozen pots here with some dirt and water the dirt in. And then when you cut this back right off the bat, I would probably cut the tip off of this and cut this here, strip the lower bitties, and okay. then just in the dirt. plunk them into the dirt. So anything you cut back like this here, this crisscrossy mofo, right. I would take that and make a whole new plant. So right here at the nerbal kind of thing, like nerbal, right. is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I'm calling it a fucking nerbal from now on. <laughs> so cut it at the nerbal and then take these little guys off to like Yeah, where? so I would cut this down here, right at the base. Right. And then from here, you would take it from this nerbal <laughs> and you would cut that off there. I would cut off the tip okay. and I would strip from about here down. Okay. Okay. Just so that it doesn't have to put all that energy into the like coming this way because okay. a lot of times there's some things you want to leave the tip, right. but there's a lot of things that if you snip the tip, it's not going to, it's going to send it a signal that it can't grow up anymore. Okay. And it sends the signal, well, I better sense. make some flipping roots right. that so sense. I can survive whatever these people are putting me through. Right. So the rule of thumb is say like half of stripping, half of stripping from the Yeah. Down. I mean, I think it depends on really how big your cutting is, but right. yeah, I would say strip anything off that's going in the dirt for sure and okay. you always want I, I shoot for like at least that much in the dirt but okay. some things you can you can propagate from smaller cuttings like if okay. you were doing a flox yes. if you were if you were like uh shortening your flox doing like a spring pinch yeah. you could just take off the last couple leaves stick it in and oh, do a thing okay. right that's awesome and these are these okay still like they're hurting. Like I got these from a local person, but they've just never done well. Yeah. I, I mean, they don't look super happy. That no. one looks pretty happy. Yeah. But these two don't look happy. And I did from watching your episode on the blueberries take out from the center and try to do the crisscross thing, right? Oh, so that getting, go. getting the, um, more light in on the interior. So, Beautiful. um, I tried that, but I was like, oh no, like at least three of them are not doing as well, but I'm maybe fertilizer. That's why I was thinking like, when's a good time to fertilize my berries? Oh, okay. So fertilizing berries, I think it, I mean, it depends on what your soil is doing already, but for me, I usually give a good healthy dose of compost in the fall. Okay. So I give a rich compost and then a mulch usually in the right. fall. In the spring, I'll probably give a couple comfrey feeds okay. just in the springtime. Just in the spring. And then I let them go oh. all year. Okay. Some people feed, I think, like all through spring and summer and like really bang that out. Okay. But it's just never really been. Yeah, I've never really like. Fertil I just learned about your comfrey. So <laughs> yes, so I, I so have a question about comfrey. So. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah. in the springtime, I would give a couple, like you know, 
maybe two, three comfrey fertilized, like comfrey waters in, and it would be like every couple weeks or something like that. Okay. So because you have mulch here, right? You have this wood mulch. Yeah. I would even in the fall, I would Pull even back. take this back. Yeah. And oh, look at all your ants. I have so That could many be why ants. they're not happy too. Okay. I've definitely. I have a lot of ants. I've definitely had issue before where like there was a couple rose bushes that kept dying over and over and over again. And I couldn't freaking figure out why I couldn't get them to live. Yeah. And then I dug them out and there was Ants. thousands of ants they had made colonies all yeah. the way around my rose bushes so i don't so know if that's I'm what thinking, killed them but i'm thinking that might be because we actually had to take a tree down last year it was literally covered in ants like sometimes landscape fabric like okay. if you give them a good comfy place to live then the oh, ants are like oh sweet you know sense. like you set yeah. down a pot yeah. and then you pick up the pot next year and you're like what the ants yes why ants. did you make your home here right. leave me be okay so sometimes so i think it's sense. like you just when you give them too cozy of a place to exist right that's what they do but okay i mean who knows but yeah, yeah in the fall i would probably peel this back i would put some good a good healthy host of compost under yeah. there yeah. and then you could put your mulch back over top of it okay okay that's good to know but uh, i actually learned something new uh Last year, year before last, because I always thought that you wanted to cut off any new shoots that came up. Yeah. And I was told by someone who's been growing for a lot, a lot of years that with blueberries in specific, you actually want to allow those to come up okay. and continuously cut back your oldest growth. So whereas for years I pruned my blueberries so like if you look at this one here, right. I would, I would prune this so that, you know, you're opening up the center, getting rid of the crisscrosses and cutting out any new growth that comes up. Like here. Yes. So this is good. But what he said, and he's been growing for longer than I've been alive. Yeah. And he said that he leaves these. Okay. And then every couple years he cuts back the oldest growth. So like right. if you look at this, these branches here look like the oldest ones, right? Yeah. So yeah. this year you might at, in fall or maybe next yeah. spring you might cut a couple of those back okay. and then promote more of this growth right. and my thought on it before was like you know when you have a grafted tree or something mm. and if you bury it too deep right. you get all of those shoots and right. it's not the same thing no, and a tree. because yeah, yeah because exactly yeah. because it's been grafted on so then you're getting the original tree and you're killing off your grafted bit right. and I just I think I just thought that for all the things, I was like, oh, any any of these shoots that pop up, cut them out with the blueberries and stuff. Right. But he said, no, he said it's more like, it's not exactly like raspberries where you want to cut back last year's growth every time, right. but it's along the same line where it's like, this is going to be what's giving you fruit in three years, like in a, like probably three years, this will yep. have fruit on it. These will be dying back. Right. So like, think about that one there where you yeah, have just one. And I just, and I, and I had in the past cut, you can see the stems. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so that's, that's what I did for fruit. years, right? <laughs> for years I did yeah. that too. Right. And then he wow, set me straight and I was small. like, okay. And you can see too on your black current here. Yeah. When you look at these old, these are super old, these guys, and these are new, right? right? Yeah. So then this year, if you cut off the big ends that are crisscrossing yes. and then next year you cut off the next, an, another couple of these big ends and you right. just keep allowing this new growth to come, yep. then it will produce fruit forever and ever. Amen. And I can get new uh, yeah. shoots off of the, all the old ones. Yes. They're kind of spindly. And yeah. Because ones here. Yeah. I can do the exact same. Like one. Exactly. Before. I can have more. Black yeah, current. you'll just keep making more yes. and more currant bushes. Yes. Yes. That's what I want. <laughs> right? That's the goal. This is what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here is my comfrey from last year. Beautiful. Really, it's not gone bad. Like it's gonna stink. Yeah, it's, if it's not stinky, it's not right. Ooh, girl. Right? She ripe. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Really? Yeah. Yes. Good so job. So this is alive? Yeah. Nice. That's a whole damn thing. Yeah. She stank. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. 
So when I go to fertilize, what is the ratio you think? So, I mean, every everything is different. How how much comfrey did you put to water? Um, I probably put in a half, maybe like to here. With comfrey? With comfrey. Yeah. And then filled it up with water. Okay. And then as it brewed and I used it and then I'd add more comfrey because the season was getting, we were starting to lose, you know, winter yeah. and, and stuff. So I took the last bit of comfrey that I had and I filled it up as high as I could with water, tied this baby on here. Good. And it's been brewing since October. Beautiful. Okay, this is absolutely lovely. I typically, in say like a, like this a, is what I have a for watering, watering can. Like I'll take like, these are my buckets. These are what I have. This is my watering can. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's perfect. I was gonna say in my, I have a two gallon watering can. Okay. And in it, I probably put like an ounce or two of the comfrey fertilizer in each one of these. Really? So, that's it? Like, oh yeah. That's all you need. That's that's all you need. You can do it. it um, you can do way more of it once they get used to it or like on things that take heavy, heavy feeds. Okay. But typically when I'm starting out, it's like a couple ounces into one of these is all wow. I need for my first feed. Wow. And then I build it up, build it up, build it up. Okay. And so by building it up, say then say in like my first feed, I'm going to do my raspberries and my blueberries and my strawberries mm -hmm. and my garlic. garlic. Yeah. So I'm going to go one ounce to two gallons. And yeah. then, you know, maybe the next week I'm gonna go two ounces to two gallons. Yes. And then just keep doing that. And exactly. then and so am I gonna fertilize every week? I'm usually out here on Sundays. You and... definitely could. Okay. If you wanna like if you have the time in your day yeah. to to feed with comfrey every week, your plants would love it. Okay. They would love it. Yes. I don't have time for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, the, I mean, this is my little area. They're lucky to get I a have... couple good feeds and then I'm like, yeah. Shit, I'm sorry, I forgot about you guys. Right, I'm right, moving on. Right, but... right. Yeah. Well, mine is so much littler, you know, and I'm okay with that for now. Oh yeah, know? no, this so... is beautiful. And then I have another question while we're right here. Okay. What works best in beds? I mean, I think that to me, the answer would be less of like what does best in beds and what does best together or what does best following each other. Right. Because there's some things that use up a ton of nitrogen. Okay. And then there's some things that give back a ton of nitrogen. Okay. So then to me, I would say more like like cycling things through is yes. better. So yes. like if you have a perennial strawberry box, that's that's wonderful. Like your strawberries come back every time. Right. That's beautiful. You could plant some nasturtium around it or some okay. flowers, you know, some um alyssum is a great little trap crop, whatever. Or okay. to keep the slugs off your strawberries, mm -hmm. you could do like a trap crop of cabbage at each corner or something like that. And then mm -hmm. the slugs and snails will just gravitate. Or even right. here, like if you want to keep the slugs out of your box, yep. you could just dig down a little bit on the outsides of your boxes, right. plant a couple cabbages around the base, oh. and then the slugs won't even bother coming up in here and eating your stuff. Okay. Um, Veggie-wise, yes. I think like I would plant basically anything in a box. Really? Like if, okay. if I wanted to do, say, say I was starting a box and I wanted to break down some hard pan, I would do things like carrots and daikons and things like that that go down and break earth okay i might follow that with like a nice bed of peas after that so if you do Ooh, pea shoots true. like pea shoots are so tender and yep. so sweet and yep. so delicious delicious and it locks all that good stuff in so then you could following the the larger tap roots that break things up right. you could do boom bunch of peas right eat up the pea shoots once yeah. the peas are all done i would say you know the world's your oyster like okay. you can do whatever you want to i i love to interplant too so say you want lettuce right and you're gonna have lettuce boom 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 okay. right 
these lettuce are going to come out and do this, yep. but you could still sow carrots right down the middle oh. because you would get like carrots when you seed a carrot, carrots like to stay moist. Like when you seed a carrot, that seed doesn't ever want to be dry <laughs> until oh. it's like big and established and then it can handle some wet, dry, wet, dry conditions. But when right. you seed carrots, they want to stay damp basically always. <laughs> they don't ever okay. want to be dry at well, all. that's good to know. So well, like my carrots were only this big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you were gonna sow this box with say like lettuce or yeah. your greens, right? Yeah. I would do the greens on the outside right. and then the leaves can kind of do their thing and fill the space. Yeah. I would sow carrots in the center. Right. And if you have any burlap okay. too, sometimes okay. when I seed my carrots, I'll go and soak a bunch of burlap and then I'll just run the burlap, the soaking wet burlap over top of my seeded carrots. Oh. And then that like keeps that moisture in there all the time. And then as soon as you start to see it sprout, yep. I take off the burlap and then okay. I just keep it watered keep and it watered. whatever. Okay. But then this way, your carrot greens will have enough space to pop up the top. Yep. Your lettuce would be here and here and yep. the carrots would be reaching down in and getting that coverage so it kind of stays a little bit cooler in there. Right. That right. So sense. it's more about companions yes. and rotation right. to me than like what, what likes it best because I feel like grow, grow everything in a box if yeah. you want to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> grow it all. Your garlic, the garlic would probably love these boxes. Okay. I think that garlic is a heavy feeder. Yeah. So it likes to so. eat a lot and it loves foliar feeds too. So okay. if you have like a pump sprayer and you wanted to put a bit of comfrey or yeah. like seaweed, like yeah. liquid seaweed, Ooh. anything like that, you could spritz it. I, I don't, I don't do foliar sprays when the sun is shining. Right. I do them usually like like either early, early morning before the sun comes up or like yeah. later in the evening, yeah. just so that the sun doesn't burn whatever you're putting on it. Right. Um, but you can but, see like from at this time of day and it's kind of the same way in the summer too. I lose a lot of sun because we have a lot of trees in behind. Yeah. So, but you know what you get, I mean this, I the morning. Yeah. This is I mean, a beautiful okay. amount of sunshine. So you think this positioning here of the greenhouse is okay? I think it's lovely. Okay. I think Good. it's absolutely lovely. Okay. I think you picked a perfect spot for this Okay. and great. you're doing amazing. You should give yourself more credit, <laughs> I think, because I, I got some of your garlic last year yeah. and it was delicious Good. and it was big and it was wonderful. Yep. Actually, we had it, we we hung it up on our little coat rack outside the door. I was going to make pickles or something like that. And I was like, shit, I am out of garlic. How can this happen? And Cody was like, didn't Brendan's mom give you garlic when we were there last time? And I was like, oh, <laughs> run outside to the porch. There's your bundle of garlic. I'm like, yes, like it was so successful. It was wonderful. So, um, I lost my mom in October and one of her wishes was to get a lilac tree. I know. I said to her, Ma, I would love to get a tree that, you know, that you love, that I can put somewhere on the property. And she's like, oh, you could get a fruit tree. And I'm like, but Ma, I don't want to eat you, right? <laughs> so I'm like, pick a flowering tree or bush or something. So yeah. she settled on a lilac one. And this one apparently is super, um, like it has a beautiful smell, purple flowers, which she loved purple. Lovely. So, um, yeah, so I kind of thought here, but I wanted wanted your opinion because it needs sun. Yeah, I mean, it definitely wants sunshine. Um, and 12 this, feet high by 12 feet wide. So the only thing that I would think of doing it here, like from this view, mm -hmm. this, would look friggin' magnificent, right? If you have this, say you did it like basically this. Right. Then eventually that's gonna grow out. It will be pretty, but it's it's a little contained. Like it, yeah. it depends on if you 
you know. Like I could easily come back um, as far. This was one of her pigs. She grew up in Alberta oh on a hog farm and had probably 300 pigs, like little ornaments and stuff like that, that I dispersed to the whole family. So this was one of them. So I thought this little guy, he's going to live in my garden I with mom. That. If you want to be able to just have it here and this is its space. This is, that's, she loved my garden. Then that's so beautiful, This is right? where I hang, so. Yeah. I'm sure this is not how professionals do it. Okay. When I try and think of what I'm gonna plant, so I'm like, oh, I wanna plant this shrub here. This shrub gets this tall. Right. I'll stand where I think I'm gonna plant it. Yeah. And then I'm like, where does my shade reach? You know, and I look and I'm like, oh, okay. okay. At this time of so you're day. Still in the sun. Yeah, like at this time of day, yep. the shadow reaches okay. right to there. So you know. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yes, that's awesome. Right? So yeah. then you know that basically after years, like years. it would take a lot of years yep. for it to get Huge. magnificent and fill this space. Yeah. But it would get okay. magnificent and fill the space. Okay. And eventually, my guess is you would have some extra shade right here. Right. Like where you see my hand path yeah. along this garden. Yeah. But that's so okay, in because lettuce like shade. Right? right? Exactly. So in I five, ten see. years, when this thing is magnificent, yeah. and it's shading over here, yeah. that just means that you plant the things that like the shade right. there. Perfect. That just like a little bit shadier yeah. of a vibe. Yeah. Right? Sure. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, like to me, I feel like right there. Like this, but I mean, follow your heart. Whatever yeah, your course. heart says, of obviously, course. but of course. Like to me, this feels like you can enjoy it from all the way around. Yeah. You could, you know, have a little sitting zone, whatever. Yeah. You could like like to me this is a beautiful from all around vibe. And I have a bench in my greenhouse that mom would always sit on. Mm. So it's a little bench and this is enough room. I could put the bench here. I can enjoy my garden. I can talk to my mom because I talk to her all the time. So I would dig back, like I would pull, pull back, back a decent amount. Yep. When you dig the hole, yep. <clears throat> I would probably dig it like I would give it almost like a foot like that. I would like just go like that. I would then... probably actually dig it back, like pull this stuff back yeah. here-ish. Okay. I would give it a big hole yeah. and then I would dig it down pretty deep. Okay. And I would put a bunch, cause I mean, how much rain do we get here? Yeah. Rain, yeah. rain, rain, rain. Yeah. So like I would put a bunch of stone in the bottom, probably okay. some rock and stuff yeah. underneath it, just so that it's not as like densely saturated right. all the time. Right. And then I actually have um, some mycorrhizal fungi at home too, okay. which you could have some of that. It just helps to sort of like activate all of the biddies that are in the soil okay. and you can, it can make contact with the roots and it okay. kind of just, it just adds in a bunch of life, a okay. bunch of life. Like okay. the, the mycelial network that goes through, like there's like so much life that connects all underneath the trees okay. and all that kind of right. stuff. And that's all it is, is it just boosts that a little bit, okay. right? And so, is that something that I would put down before the plant or yeah. on the plant or well, before the plant? So you could do it two ways. Uh, you can make direct contact with the root. So like when you pull this out of the pot, you would take the mycorrhizal fungi and you would just toot, toot, toot on the roots okay. and you would put it in, yep. or you can sprinkle it in the hole and you can kind of see okay sloof it about yeah. and then do your thing and then i would say that you know good good amount of compost in the hole okay make sure that there's lots of drainage yeah. lots to eat okay and then you could you know malt put some mulch back around it and okay. everything but okay okay so tomatoes the thing with tomatoes is first of all you want to know if they're determinant or indeterminate so the way I try and think about it is determinant is a plant that is predetermined what it's gonna do. It's like think like it's a compact car. It's gonna be what it's gonna be. An indeterminate tomato is did I say potato the first time? No. Nope. Okay. Tomato. <laughs> did I? You're thinking potato. Did I say potato or tomato? Yeah. Put that on the blue parole, don't put it in the episode. Should I start over? <laughs> Sorry. So indeterminate tomatoes are basically 
wild and free. Okay. There is no determination on what it can be. It is indeterminate. Okay. So determinant tomatoes, the way you prune them back, they usually get most of their tomatoes ripe at the same time. They're gonna be more like a bush. Okay. Indeterminant is gonna be a vine right. that you can train wherever. Yeah. My indeterminants, I, the rule of three, you know how we were talking about yes. it over there? Yeah. My, I do it as a rule of three. So when it comes up, yeah. I pinch off the main head. I pinch its tip. Okay. Then it, from the base, it spreads out multiple ways. I choose its three mains. Okay. And then I allow those to go. And like if it was on here, yeah. And you had a tom tomato planted there. Yeah. I would clip one here. I would clip one here. I would clip one here. Okay. This guy, I would do something here. This guy, I would send off this way. Okay. And then I would pinch every other sucker that came off of it okay. and just allow the fruit to come. So is the sucker the little nurable that comes off the off the say the main and it has a bit of a leaf? Yes. Okay. So that that's where you pinch it off there. Yes. The thing is though is that if you have a tomato that's more like a bush tomato. Right. And you pinch that, sometimes you're pinching the fruit off. Yes. So on a viney tomato, yes, pinch all those bitties. Okay. Get rid of them. So They're that's just the difference. Steal, yes. But if you have a tomato that's more like a bush, so that's and you pinch all that. actually pinching off all the flowers. That's yeah. why it was just all green and no tomato. It could be, yes. <laughs> That could be, that could be perhaps what happened. Oh, wow, okay, uh, well that's good to know. I had no idea there was two different kinds, determinant and indeterminate. Yes, in, in, indeterminate, yes, so that's, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not an expert. I feel like that's how I say it. I hope that's how everybody says it. Yeah, well, whatever. That's how I say it. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Holy tomato. Cool. Maybe I'll try tomatoes this year. <laughs> you should. And the other cool thing too is if you did them, say you say you made a box right here and you did them. Sure. You could even do something as simple as like <clears throat> just while they're starting and it's the cold rainy season or you feel a cold snap coming on. You come outside and you're gonna have your coffee yeah. and you're like, mm, I don't freaking know about this. I feel some cold in the air. Yeah. You could come out here with a piece of poly, like any clear plastic, yeah. whatever. You could drape it over this fence line Kid. and just pin it. Just pin, pin, pin. No tuck way. it under the wood right there. Yeah. And you would make your own little mini greenhouse right on it. Honestly, I never would have thought that. Like I've been keeping all of my, you know, when you buy a cake or muffins and they come in those so I'm yes. keeping all those because those are mini greenhouses. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I do the same freaking thing. Okay. I do the same thing because then you can seed into them and then yes. you close it in its and own it's little mitt. Yes. Yeah. I see. I save all of my like veggie. What are they called? Terra packs or yes. something? The plastic Terra yes. packs. Yes. And we do soil blocking at our place. And I want to learn how to do that. Yeah. So I soil blocker. I save those Terra packs and then I soil block into them and then just clip it closed and perfect. Yeah. Oh, freaking awesome. So I wanted to ask you about seeds, collecting seeds. Um, like I got these gigantic marigolds, like huge mm. marigolds. So I collected all the seeds. So as I'm, <clears throat> when I travel, I go to my friend's house. If, you know, I'm walking down the sidewalk, I'll like, you know, I just kind of grab what's on the sidewalk. Sowing seed that you've collected, just like, like a wild flowery kind sure. of vibe. Yep. I would say either fall or spring. Okay. You can do either. You can do them in the Typically, fall then. Oh yeah, because if there's something that you see that is say like a wild flower that grows all over the place and you you know nobody freaking planted that there, it's just doing its thing. Then you know that that seed is hard, hardens itself off over winter. Okay. So that seed is overwintering itself. It's a cold stratification process, basically, okay. is what okay. it's called. And so it goes through that wintering. Okay. Therefore, you could collect it in the fall, and you could just walk straight over somewhere else in your garden, and you could oh, sprinkle it out there okay. and do a little thing. Okay. And it would probably come back. You can also do it in the springtime if you want to. So like whether you're like the seed becomes ready bang 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 in the fall or you store it in somewhere like coolish mm. not too hot not too cold right and then i would say early enough spring if it's something that overwinters naturally i would say early enough in the spring that you're going to get a couple cold snaps still to sort oh, of like okay. wake it up okay um, if it's something that does not survive winter out here if it's like something like a marigold that 
it's rare for me that marigolds self-seed a ton, right. you know, like it might happen, but right. typically marigold is something that I would save the seed and then I would sow it in the springtime. I okay. wouldn't sow that one, just cast it off in the winter. Okay. But something like nasturtium you can throw out in the winter sunflowers you can throw out in the winter oh my goodness yeah things like that um, like black-eyed susans oh my god yeah okay winter for sure okay yeah yeah ab okay. absolutely so they need the when you said um in the winter to wake them up so or sorry the cold wakes them up so they need like a bulb it needs to get super cold and then it will bloom yeah exactly okay. so it's it's there's different kinds of stratification cold stratification is is just that it's the process of like if it stays warm and sunny the whole time then the plant never gets its its moment of rest okay it, this is how i see it anyway right i don't know like yeah, again no, this i'd is, rather hear it from you the, the way you see it because it makes more sense to me yeah like this is this it's hard for me sometimes because i feel like if a if a professional horticulturist was watching this they might be like ma'am you're saying this you know incorrectly i don't know but the way i see it is a being is at its strongest when it goes through its natural cycles so i need moments of deep rest right. just as much as the bulbs need moment moments of deep rest just right. as much as the seeds need moments of deep rest okay something that wants to be tropical doesn't want a cold deep rest but it still wants to chill Okay. Right? Like, right. it still right. wants time to chill out. It doesn't want to perform 24-7, okay. 365. Like, okay. it wants those moments to to have that moment of rest. So, uh, like you mentioned, the big giant marigolds. Yes. I would seed them now. Okay. I would get them in the ground nice. now. Whether okay. you seed some trays and put them in your greenhouse or yep. anything like that. If it's things like the Rebecca or the Susans, whatever it might yeah. be. I would say whether it's fall or spring, you can do it. Like I did my Echinacea and some Echabecchia and Rebecca in January and basically like left them out to be snowed on in pots. Oh. So I just sprinkle them on. Yep the top like just barely kind of get them in there leave them outside they get snowed on they get really cold and then as soon as it's like past winter like past the winter cold i bring all those pots into my greenhouse and wake them up so then they're like so oh that's how you do it they're like oh we were super cold outside but they don't have to do the whole outside cold i bring them in to wake them up early and then you know, they're three times bigger than the ones that were outside yeah. and then I... Perfect. That's awesome. That's good yeah. to know. You can see her raspberries getting taller and taller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they get less and less confident. Those ones are so short. Right now. And then they're like a little taller and a little taller and a little taller until she's like off. Oh, I wanted to ask, before I forget, rototilling. I read somewhere that the, the practice of rototilling is not good. It breaks up the microbiome in the soil and it kills the worms and it takes a long time for things to start working again. Um, that being the case, I have an area that um, I need to turn. If, if I don't rototill, what other practice could I do? Yeah, okay, so I have a few thoughts on rototilling. I err to the side of no till, but we do still till certain things, right? Yeah. There's certain areas where like if you're trying to if you're trying to plant something and it's like a, like full of rocks and it's super compact and it's nothing but trouble, there is certain times when, you know, <clears throat> like the area where we planted our blueberries, for example, right. all of that was covered in garbage, covered in plastic covered in brambles. Right. So when all of that got peeled back and it's so rocky that yeah. like Cody tilled that whole area up a couple times and yeah. tilled a bunch of really good stuff in there. Okay. And then we'll never till it again. Right. If it's happening once, you know, like you're tilling it to to start something and you don't have any other, you feel like you don't have much of other options or whatever, you till it, you get it started and then you don't till it ever again. Right. Okay. I think that like the problem for me from everything that I understand about it is more that the problem is if you're going to till every year, so you have like 
you've got a monocrop. You've got this one crop that you do and every year you hack it down and you till your soil. You hack it down, you till your soil. It's breaking down more and more and more. Every time you do that, it's releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. Right. It's killing that all the beautiful bacteria and all that like network that has connected. Right. Right. It's breaking it all up and killing it, right? right. So then it I'm starts sure. to basically dry out and yeah. it turns into like a desert out right. there. It's right. it breaks that soil down. Right. So where I do no till, I <clears throat> usually what I'll do is you can either cover it with a tarp, okay. like say in the fall. Right. You cover it with a a good thick black tarp all winter long that that area is breaking down. In the spring, you put down a bunch of cardboard, you wet the cardboard, you put down a bunch of compost, and then you say mulch your paths in between or something like that. Sure. And then you can plant into that. It's okay. a good thick layer of compost on top. Okay. And it's going to break through and get down into the soil. Okay. Um, if you wanted to dig out the grass, like say you have like a really weedy, grassy area, you could do like Monty Don does this thing where he'll, uh, if he's starting a new garden area or whatever, he'll dig up the grass and then he puts the grass down so that it's grass to grass. And then he takes the next piece and it's dirt to dirt. And then he takes the next piece and it's grass to grass. And if you put it all layered up, it'll, it can grow this way. But if you put them layered back and forth, then it actually can squish all that stuff out and wow. break it down. And then he'll just, you know, leave it break down for however long. It's not right. something that he turns like a compost okay. pile. He okay. just leaves that to break down and then wow. eventually it can become usable soil again and it can be something else. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, it, to me, tilling isn't inherently inherently awful it's not something that like never again shall you till a thing it's mm. to me it's like it does serve some purposes in some places right is it the best option no right is it my first choice no right but does it come in super handy sometimes absolutely okay so okay, okay. <clears throat> That's that's good to know. Here's the thing, though. If you're not worried about planting that garden right now, yeah. you're like preparing it for next year yeah. or the year after yeah. or whatever, yeah. I wouldn't till it. <clears throat> okay. I wouldn't. Okay. I would layer your cardboard and your compost over top of it. So is it the area that you have the black yeah. tarp on yeah. right now? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So when you're ready to do it, peel it back, cardboard and compost. And then you could even cover it back up with the tarp if you wanted okay. to, you know, <clears throat> cover it up, yeah. let it go. And then yeah. next year, peel it back again cardboard, more okay. compost, and then it's going to be layered up with all that beautiful stuff. And because when you do no-till, when you layer that stuff on, instead of it, the tiller breaks it all up and kills all those things and yeah. busts it into pieces. Right. But think if you think about like a compost pile or like a verma compost situation where you could do stacks of buckets and you have all your worms and then you put your compost and then it moves up, the worms move up to the next layer. Right. And then you can add another bucket with more holes in it and more compost and the worms will come up into there and you can oh. take that bucket out yeah. because they're constantly moving through it, okay. right? Okay. And it's the same thing with no-till. If right. you lay down that cardboard and then you lay down that compost, yeah. all of those good bitties yes. that are in your soil yes. are going to move up in up. okay well, we, that makes sense i feel like i mean there's no right or wrong all questions are good but i feel like you're you're just so on the right track oh, like good. your question thank you you're so thoughtful about what's best for the earth mm -hmm. it's like you know that you want to be able to eat it you want to be able yes. to benefit from yes. it you want to look at it yes. you want it to be beautiful yes but the thing that that seems to be the key thread in all of your questions and all of how like thoughtful you're being in this is that you want to do what's best for the land right. which just I is I, I mean that's more important than anything else you can learn along the way you can make mistakes you can do anything like it but if you're if that's what your guiding light is yes. is what's best for this land then yes. it's given back to me so much i in my life could not be able to give this land what it has given me 
like honestly. I love that so much. <laughs> that brings me so much joy because I think that that's so important. And it's also, I don't know, it's such like a beautifully inspiring thing that's happening here too, which is that j this is three generations that have lived on this land yes. and become a part of this land. Yes. And I mean, I just, Oh, I that know. just makes a person's heart happy. I you know? <laughs> makes that, my heart happy. That just makes like, a person's honestly. heart. Oh, I'm so glad you came out. Thank you so much for you your so wealth welcome. of information. And you've actually given me confidence. Oh, you're in... doing an amazing job. I mean, just even saying that and coming from you is huge. <laughs> no, you're doing an absolutely amazing job. So, this yard is beautiful. Thank you. Give me a squish. <laughs> Oh, thanks, hon. You I appreciate it. it. It was fun. It was fun. Thank That's you. Yours. Okay, well, thanks for joining us on this episode. I know it's a little bit different than the things that we normally put out, but it was a really special ask from someone who we love a lot. So hopefully if any of Jerry's questions that she had help any of you, then, you know, it's double awesome. So I hope you guys have a great day and we'll see you again soon. I don't have pockets to put my hands in. I don't know what to do. Can I have a dog, baby? Back like a baby. What's happening? Is this the answer? Well, you got something with your hands now. <laughs>